Your Highness, Ms. Mohammed, your, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, friends of the Global Center for Pluralism. My name is John McNee, and it is my great honor to serve as the Secretary General of the Global Center. I am delighted to welcome you on behalf of our Board of Directors at this evening, our seventh annual Pluralism Lecture with United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. We are very, very happy that this year's lecture is taking place in Lisbon, a cosmopolitan city that illustrates what a pluralistic society truly looks like. I'd like to begin by thanking our partners in organizing this event, the Canadian Ambassador Lisa Rice Madan and her colleagues, and Nazim Ahmad and the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat for their unstinting support. And we are very grateful to the Ismaili Council of Portugal for graciously hosting this year's lecture in this beautiful center. Our center invited Ms. Mohammed to deliver this year's lecture on how pluralism can advance the sustainable development goals because of her extraordinary leadership in ushering in the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 17 goals at the heart of the 2030 Agenda resonates strongly with the mission of the Global Center for Pluralism. Like pluralism, they are universal in their application. All UN member states have adopted them as national goals, and the goals are intended to benefit everyone. And inclusion, which is at the heart of the goals, is also key to our center's focus on strengthening positive responses to diversity in today's societies all around the world. The Global Center for Pluralism was created in 2006 through a partnership between His Highness the Aga Khan and the Government of Canada. Inspired by Canada's experience as a multi-ethnic, multicultural society, the Center is founded on the premise that when diversity is valued, societies are more peaceful and more successful. In 2017, His Highness and the former Governor General of Canada, David Johnston, officially opened our international headquarters in Ottawa. Today, it is a destination for dialogue, brimming with events and programming for Canadian and global audiences. We foster research and education to advance understanding about the sources of inclusion and exclusion around the world. The annual pluralism lecture is one such initiative. It provides an opportunity for all of us to learn from distinguished speakers like Ms. Muhammad, whose advocacy and example inspire us all. Tonight's lecture is very timely. 2019 is a defining year with a series of regional fora and high-level meetings now underway, leading up to a gathering of heads of state this September at the UN in New York. It will be the first UN summit to review progress on the Sustainable Development Goals. Tonight, we are very, very fortunate to have Amina Mohammed with us to lay out the challenge and to share her thoughts on how pluralistic institutions and attitudes can help to ensure that no one is left behind. Following the lecture, Ricardo Costa, director of Espresso, will open a conversation with Ms. Mohammed and extend the opportunity for you to ask questions. Senor Costa needs no introduction this evening. He is one of Portugal's most respected opinion leaders. Finally, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, who is the chair of the Center's Executive Committee, will offer closing remarks. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor now to invite His Highness the Aga Khan, chair of the board of the Global Center for Pluralism, to introduce our speaker. Ms. Muhammad, Your Excellency, the President of the Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the board of the Global Center of Pluralism to the 2019 Pluralism Lecture here at the Ismaili Center in Lisbon. I am delighted that this seventh annual lecture 
is being delivered in Portugal. And I say that not only because this beautiful country is steeped in global history and culture, and usually drenched in sunshine. <laughs> For those of us who believe in the bridge-building work of pluralism, Portugal has much to teach, even as it confronts its own challenges. This country is blessed with a long history of productive coexistence among Christians, Jews, and Muslims. The history of Al-Andalus was written here on the Iberian Peninsula between the 8th and the 16th centuries. This blending of cultures, religions, and languages brought innovations in architecture, agriculture, medicine, and even cuisine that are woven now into the very fabric of modern Portugal. In July last year, the Global Peace Index ranked Portugal amongst the five most peaceful nations in the world, and for good reason. At a time of rising intolerance, this country has established some of the most welcoming policies for migrants in Europe. As populations in many Western countries are aging and even dwindling, Portugal is among the few that recognize that newcomers are essential to secure the country's future. This welcoming attitude is one of the most strongly associated with pluralism which is the core mission of the Global Center for Pluralism. As a beacon of research, education, and dialogue, the center is drawing lessons from the political, social, and cultural dynamics in diverse and divided societies around the world. I encourage all of you to explore what the center has to offer. By learning from others' successes, we may help our own societies to inoculate themselves against the temptation to set various people against one another, including the temptation to exclude marginalized populations. Tonight's speaker, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, has had an extraordinary life journey, and we are all privileged to be able to benefit from her insights. Thank you. Ms. Mohammed's active, in, active involvement with global development and her passionate commitment to girls' education both go back almost 20 years when she coordinated the Task Force on Gender and Education for the United Nations Millennium Project. In 2005, as Senior Special Assistant to the President of Nigeria on the Millennium Development Goals, she was charged with steering Nigeria's debt relief funds toward achieving those goals. The MDGs, in shorthand, refer to the eight goals that gave the world a blueprint for tackling its greatest social and economic challenges from 2000 to 2015. Ms. Muhammad at first described herself as something of a septic about that project. How could one possibly reduce the world's challenges to eight goals, she asked. Nonetheless, she embraced the cause. With dogged persistence, she helped to ensure that some $1 billion a year went where it was needed and intended, to reducing maternal mortality, giving communities safe water access, and providing good schools and teachers for Nigerian students. In 2012, Amina Mohammed took on another global role as Special Advisor to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the next stage of the United Nations Development Planning, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Her new challenge was to work with a small number, 193 nations, to replace the MDGs with a new overarching framework for global development up to 2030. 
In characterizing this new framework era, Ms. Mohammed has said, and I quote, development is no longer an issue of the global south. It is an issue of the global north, south, east, and west. Indeed, all member nations of the United Nations, including Canada, Portugal, and Nigeria, and 190 other countries have accepted the goals as their own national objectives. Agenda 2030 calls for action by all countries for all people. Ms. Mohammed then stepped from the conceptual stage at the United Nations back into the implementation area at home. As Federal Minister of Environment, she steered Nigeria's action on climate change and resource conservation for sustainable development. Ms. Mohammed is an outspoken advocate for global action on climate change, for children's education, and for the protection of human rights. Above all, she has described gender equality, sustainable development goal number five, as the, quote, docking station for all the other goals and essential conduit for their achievement. She has served as director, governor, or advisor on numerous boards, including the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, Canada's International Development Research Center, and the Global Development Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And she has received too many honors and awards for me to name, for I fear I will leave no time for her lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great privilege to welcome our annual pluralism lecturer for 2019, Mrs. Amina Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Highness. Your Excellency, um, Your Highness, the Aga Khan, Excellencies, the President of the Assembly, um, ladies and gentlemen, and I see many friends in the audience as we came through this evening. It's really a great pleasure um, and a privilege to be here with you to talk about pluralism and its central place in the work of the United Nations, and especially in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's also wonderful to be in this center. It's a really beautiful building, and uh, the gardens, the courtyards, the two research institutions helping us um, to bridge the gulf between Islam and Western cultures. I thank the GCP. Um, you know, the UN's full of acronyms, so I'm going to give you another one here, but the Global Center for Pluralism, and the Ismaili Imamat for this opportunity, and for all the incredible work that you do to promote pluralism, diversity, inclusion, and a better and more peaceful world for all of us. The tension between unity and pluralism between the whole and its constituent parts has been debated by thinkers and philosophers for thousands of years. Two millennia ago, the Indian Emperor Ashoka the Great called for harmonious relations between peoples of all religions and respect for each other's scriptures. At the United Nations, there's a magnificent carpet, a gift from the people of Iran, inscribed with the poem known as Bani Adam, the children of Adam, by the great Persian poet Saidi. And part of it reads, if you have no sympathy for the troubles of others, you are unworthy to be called by the name of human. At this gathering last year, the religious scholar Karen Armstrong said that the first thing that appealed to her about Islam was its pluralism and the fact that the Holy Quran not only praised all the great prophets of the Abrahamic religions, but accepted them as prophets of Islam. Indeed, pluralism, respect for difference, and the ethics of a shared common humanity are features of many of our different cultures and our religions. My own continent, Africa, includes some of the most pluralistic societies in the world with a diversity of tribal, ethnic, cultural, and religious groups different traditions, and people that are divided along urban and rural realities. Pluralism is the DNA in the, is the, DNA in the, in the United Nations. The Charter, our founding document, refers to we the peoples. 
of the United Nations and says, who are determined to practice tolerance and to live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Today, I won't add to the philosophical debate around pluralism. I believe the argument has largely been fought and won, although we must always remain vigilant. But while the theoretical argument may be over, we still have a long way to go before we can say that our world is living up to this promise. In some cases, there are historical and cultural obstacles or a lack of knowledge or misunderstanding. In others, it's a question of political will and I may even say today, the generation gap. What I'd like to talk about today is the gap between the words and the actions, between the ideal of pluralism and the policies and strategies that will enable us to reap its benefits in our daily lives. I'd like to link pluralism to the work of the UN on the ground around the world, promoting human rights, inclusion and respect for diversity. The only way, I believe, that we can leave no one behind and effectively address the global challenges we face and further peace and prosperity for everyone. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, in the framework of the UN and our current global agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, we've embedded the principle of inclusion, a word that is largely synonymous with pluralism. In fact, one of the 17 goals is dedicated to building peaceful and inclusive societies. I would say that the two are not separate but the societies are more peaceful because they are inclusive. We have growing evidence that greater diversity and inclusion, particularly in relation to the inclusion of women, is correlated with higher GDP, more responsive governments, better bottom lines, greater stability, and more sustainable peace and development. But if the business case for inclusion is clear, certainly today we would say that our actions fail to reflect this. While many leaders may pay lip service to inclusion, the fact is that we are living the consequences of exclusion. Intolerance, exclusion, the need to dominate, a lack of respect for difference are deeply rooted in many of our policies and systems, political, economic, and social. We've created a world in which, according to recent analysis by 2030, the richest 1% of people could control two thirds of the planet's wealth. Economic and in many cases political power is often concentrated in the hands of very few. The rights of women and girls and of minorities and marginalized people of all kinds are routinely disregarded. In many cases, those in power hang on by any means for far too long. And often, I believe, out of fear for themselves being excluded. Inequality is at extraordinary levels and is growing both within and in between our countries. After a decade of decline, the number of chronically hungry people in our world recently began to rise again, despite there being abundant food for everyone. We've created a world in which we define security as the enforcement of borders, exclusion of others, and amassing of weapons. We see this in the estimated $1.8 trillion in military spending just last year, a fraction of which would provide dignity and opportunity for the most vulnerable. We've created a world in which there is growing ethno-nationalism, intolerance, discrimination, and violence that targets women, our mothers, our sisters, our grandmothers, minorities and migrants, refugees, and anyone that is perceived to be different or other. Civic space is shrinking, basic rights are under attack, things that we've often taken for granted. Activists and journalists are targeted, misinformation campaigns and hate speech spread like wildfire on social media. Hate speech is moving into the mainstream in many countries and regions, liberal democracies and authoritarian states alike. Constitutions that are founded on pluralism and respect for difference are undermined as different groups and minorities are attacked. Access to information is curated individually so that we are living atomized lives in our own echo chambers where news and advertising reflect and reinforce our assumed perspective of the world. Unless we ourselves choose to seek out others, we may not be exposed, as we have been before, to alternative viewpoints and arguments that challenge our beliefs. Attacks on places of worship are some of the most egregious examples of a lack of respect for each other and for our common humanity. And they are rising. 
In the past few months alone, we've seen horrific attacks in mosques in New Zealand, in churches in Sri Lanka, and in synagogues in the United States. Record numbers of people are on the move around the world, fleeing conflict, drought, poverty, and a lack of opportunity. At the same time, refugees and migrants are attacked both physically and rhetorically with false narratives that link them with terrorism and scapegoat them for many of society's ills. Millions of women and girls face insecurity and violations of their human rights every day. Violence is used to enforce patriarchy and gender inequality and police women's role in our society. Excluding half our population not only affects our mothers and daughters and sisters, it affects every one of us and distorts our societies and economic systems. We've created economies that value sometimes dubious or even destructive activities that place zero monetary value on the daily work that happens in our homes, where the very production and reproduction of the quality of our society occurs. We see the same devaluing of foundations in our society and our long-standing treatment of our natural environment, our homes. Trees are worth more as construction material than they are standing in the forest. Deforestation, overfishing, climate change and pollution are causing unprecedented damage to our natural safety net but they are driven by the logic of economic models and incentives. As a result, we now face an existential crisis as a species and are directly responsible for the threat to one million other species that may be pushed to extinction in the next few years. The climate crisis is wreaking havoc on some of the most vulnerable countries and regions, while others continue to burn fossil fuels and add to greenhouse gas emissions. No one would light a cigarette today in a room where a child is struggling to breathe, but developed countries are contributing to conditions that are causing droughts, floods, halfway around the world with complete disregard for the rights of others. We've lost sight of our common humanity and our independence on each other and on a planet that gives us life. I'd like to stress that none of this has been an accident. It is the end result of systems that have been built by men and I'm going to underscore men here because if we had men, women in charge, we probably wouldn't have been in the same mess. Largely based on the basis of exclusion, marginalization, and discrimination, and of a, polar, a prioritization of short term profits for a few over long term rights and the interests of all future generations. It is clear that we need a fundamental reordering of our priorities and a reorganization of our economic, political, and social systems if we really are to reap the benefits of inclusion and save ourselves and our planet from further inhumanity and degradation. Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in troubled times, many, many headwinds. The news, however, is not all bad. There's plenty of evidence that global efforts have worked and that further damage to societies and our planet can be prevented and reversed. After all, as I've said just a little earlier, it was and is man-made. As Steven Pinker has argued, our world is getting better, but not as quickly as we might hope. So much of the, much of the, the, the evidence that we see for progress is not catching up with the reality of the challenges, and we're in many cases just flatlining. Violence has steadily declined over time, and life expectancy is up. Extreme poverty is declining and literacy is at historically high levels. There's greater awareness of human rights, and in some countries, at least, minorities of all kinds enjoy greater legal protection than ever before. Let's take the Montreal Protocol and the ozone layer. This international treaty entered into force in 1989, after climatologists discovered a hole in the ozone layer over Antarctica. Since then, the hole has gradually started recovering, and projections indicate that the ozone layer will return to 1980 levels between 2050 and 2070. This is global cooperation. The Millennium Development Goals, and as His Highness reminded me, I wasn't very pleased with them, but I, in the end, embrace them as the baseline and not the ceiling of where we wanted to go to. They were agreed by all countries in 2000. They created one of the most successful anti-poverty movements in history. At least in my country, we benefited from a savings of a billion dollars a year that we were able to put into people's lives. 
They've helped lift more than a billion people out of extreme poverty, to make inroads against hunger, to enable more girls to attend school than ever before, and to protect our planet. The MDGs generated new partnerships and galvanized public opinion, reshaping decision-making in developed and developing countries alike. Global pluralism in the form of multilateralism achieved, achieved these things, and I believe it can achieve so much more. Since the founding of the UN, there has been wide and growing recognition that major challenges cannot be solved by countries acting alone. As we face a growing number of issues that do not respect national borders, from climate change to spreading conflict and outbreaks of disease, we need regional and global institutions more than we've ever done before. And this, I believe, to strengthen our collective response. But multilateralism may be a victim of its own success. We've stopped seeing it as a priority and an evolving challenge that we need to tend, promote and reinvigorate. We've started taking it for granted. We see this in societies and communities that are turning inward, forgetting the lessons of the past. Global institutions must hold the line for global values and to do so in these institutions, as well as our partners, we need to transform, to be fit, as I would say, for purpose in the 21st century. His Holiness the Pope has spoken of the globalization of indifference, and I believe that we must replace that with the globalization of solidarity. Four years ago in 2015, as we reached the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals, the UN initiated and coordinated a global conversation about our priorities. All countries agreed that we needed to do better. This resulted in an agreement by all of our 193 countries of the United Nations to the 2030 development agenda. Our transformational roadmap for people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnerships over the next 15 years. Already we are four years into that. This shared agenda reflects an important paradigm shift. The sustainable development goals are human-centered, they're interconnected, more importantly they are universal, integrated, inclusive and mutually reinforcing. No goal stands alone. Each goal is inextricably linked with the rest for its full implementation, although I, have, I must say I do take goal five and make that the docking station for 16. It is so important um, to our humanity. It does reflect the reality of the development challenges on the ground, where people living in poverty and hunger are also most likely to suffer from poor access to quality housing, education, health care, water and sanitation. A girl is less likely to attend school, for example, if her parents cannot afford to pay for school supplies or she doesn't have secure housing. The 2030 Agenda addresses these issues together, tackling the root causes in a much more holistic way. The Sustainable Development Goals were prepared by all countries, requiring contributions from all, including developed and developing countries. And we will, we will improve the lives of all so that in the end, no one's left behind. The emphasis of the 2030 Agenda on inclusion and interdependence, as well as a moral obligation to the most vulnerable members of our society through the principle of leaving no one behind, does offer a counterweight to the forces that are leading increased polarization, tribalism, social fragmentation. They are a conscious effort to build and replenish the world's democratic infrastructure, our relationship, social contract, and obligation to each other. The ultimate ambition of the 2030 Agenda is a world that provides dignity for all, well-being and opportunity. Qualities that do not come under the gross GDP measure that we have, but that are finally being recognized as critical measures of a su successful governance. The introduction of quality of life and well-being considerations into many budgets around the world and the country is one of those that we believe is an encouraging sign for our human family. The 2030 Agenda will require shifts in mindsets to go beyond GDP to how we will also measure our well-being. It will require a reprioritization of economic systems so that they improve the lives and make them much more meaningful. The main requirement is the political will and the leadership to push through the changes in the governance of our economies and trade systems, making them more inclusive and equitable. While the SDGs are global, they also reflect both universal values, local and traditional cultural institutions and traditions. To take one example, we can see the values of the Islamic faith. 
my own faith, reflected in many of the goals which stress environmental justice, nature, and the interdependence of things. The UN itself is changing to support countries as they take this ambitious global project, being fit for purpose. We are reforming under the leadership of Antonio Guterres, the development system, and also the peace and security, so that we are better placed to help governments and accompany them in, de in delivering on the 17 transformational goals and targets. From providing access to technical expertise, reaching global agreement on the financial arrangements that will be critical to success, the UN is at the heart of helping to deliver on the 2030 agenda. We are reforming to ensure more diverse representation, a new gender parity strategy for recruiting and retaining women as staff at all levels, particularly in leadership, that we have parity already in our management, and greater efforts to ensure much more equitable geographic representation, meaning that all persons of the world should be part of the United Nations and be actively um, represented in the leadership at the country level. We're just months away from achieving parity in our senior leadership for the first time in seven decades. We'll be 75 next year. We need to lead by example and demonstrate the importance of diversity and inclusion that reflect the reality of our world. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, this is a big picture, but it will only succeed if each and every one of us, individually and collectively, would become a part of this effort. Delivering the Sustainable Development Goals must start from every space in which people connect. The family, the community, the workplace, schools, medical clinics, small businesses, the media, academia. It is here that we will need to make the radical shift needed to achieve the 2030 Agenda. A shift in mindsets away from accumulation by few and exclusion of the many to a paradigm based on interdependence with each other and with our environment a shift in policy solutions that are based on mutual gains rather than the zero-sum thinking, and from a definition of security that is based on an ever-increasing stock of weapons and stronger borders to one that is based on resilient societies and mutual respect for each other and particularly our planet. This shift needs to start from our education systems, and as we discussed over the last two days, Education is one place that we really need to rethink how that happens for us in our world today. We continue to build schools of bricks and mortar and to teach rote learning uncritically from outdated textbooks. We are preparing our young people for a world that has passed rather than the use of technology, critical thinking skills, well-being and the ethic of shared responsibility that are really needed for a world of today and of tomorrow. While the 2030 agenda is global and all-encompassing, it will require actions at every level. It particularly needs the leadership and the guidance of faith-based and philanthropic institutions who work with the local, national, and regional levels, but exist in many international spaces that can bring these together and who can still reinstill a sense of our common humanity. The philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah has written of membership of a family, a neighborhood, a plurality of overlapping identity groups spiraling out to encompass all of humanity. This concept asks us to be many things, he says, because we are just that, many things. I'm very familiar with these ideas. My own personal story is one of multiple identities, from Nigeria to the United Kingdom and back again, from the private sector to government and the United Nations. I'm an African mother and a grandmother, and I have to tell you that my, my, uh, my children, Nigerian, British, Syrian, and it goes on, <laughs> Brazilian, grandchild, a former, um, I am also a former government minister, one that I never thought I would be. I always wanted to go home and implement the SDGs, but to be given the Ministry of Environment, which in my country was considered, for want of a better word, the dustbin lady, was really only about waste. Um, but for within 18 months, Nigeria producing um, for the continent, uh, the first uh, national uh, domestic green bond. And, and uh, I heard last week that we just had the second, and again, it was oversubscribed. So the, possible, the impossible can become possible. So as a former government minister, a survivor of gender-based violence, a faithful Muslim, granddaughter of a Presbyterian minister, and the second high, highest international civil servants, uh, humbly, in the world. 
I also received a basic education. And I think this is important because often we don't look back in history to see what is it that created the sense of insecurity that we have today, the conflict, the terrorists. But my basic education was in Meduguri. Meduguri is a, a town in the northeast of Nigeria where today Boko Haram thrives, where Lake Chad hardly exists for its shrinking. And so we see the exacerbation of poverty with climate change. While Anthony Appian and I may be the poster children for pluralism, we all embody many different identities. The growth of DNA testing proves that this in the most literal way, but it's also true socially and culturally. There is no homogeneous culture in our world, and there are simply those that are more and less honest about their history. And I'm happy to say that our hosts today, Portugal and Canada, are amongst the most honest, and I congratulate you for that. This is the kind of leadership that we truly need today. Portugal, the seat of the Ismaili Mamat, has made many significant contributions to openness, to diversity, pluralism in our world. Portugal's history of discovery, of reaching out, of connecting, has a central place in its culture. The Iberian Peninsula was for many centuries a battleground between two of the world's three major religions. And this has left a legacy of interdependence and a deep respect for cultural difference. I cannot talk, of course, about Portugal without referencing our Secretary General, my colleague, my friend, Antonio Guterres, a proud Portuguese citizen, I could tell you that, who never fails to remind us of your country's special and unique qualities. And uh, sometimes on a bad day at the UN, it's food. He's moving for you, <laughs> wants to come home. <laughs> but this is not just to him. I have to tell you that even I look for Nigerian food some days in the UN. I would also like to mention Canada, host of the Global Center of Pluralism. As a leader with respect for diversity, honoring the values of pluralism and its institutions across the entire fabric of its culture, Canada's pluralist national identity is reflected in its approach to welcoming refugees and in its fundamental to the relationship, relationship between Canada and His Highness, the Aga Khan, and of course the Foundation. No society is perfect. Most, if not all, nations have forged their borders through war or conquer, leaving a set of historical injustices that really do challenge our identities. It is how these challenges are confronted that makes clear its values. Canada's efforts to address their own relationship with the indigenous First Nations people in a spirit of honesty and reconciliation, and difficult as that can be, is one example of this leadership. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Aga Khan Development Network and the institutions for its work on behalf of some of the poorest and most marginalized communities in the world. You combine a strong ethical foundation with respect for the environment and a commitment to supporting societies in which every citizen, every person, regardless of cultural, religious, or ethnic differences, can reach his or her full potential, truly sh showing the strength in diversity. The approach to supporting all members of a community so that everyone is stronger as a result exemplifies the words of His Highness the Aga Khan, who once said that pluralism is not simply an asset or a prerequisite for development, but a vital necessity for our existence. And I agree wholeheartedly. You've been a consistent voice promoting pluralism, inclusion, and respect for diversity over the decades. We need you now more than ever. So if you were just thinking of retiring, nope. <laughs> um, and I really do thank you for your commitment and look forward to working with you, the Foundation, the Global Center for Pluralism, and for many of you that we already started with some very, very powerful partnerships who are in the room today and hope that we can broaden that base because there is never a time like now to try to make what seems incredibly impossible with the headwinds that we face. We need to face the realities boldly, with courage. We need to see the aspirations as doable because we have the means. And in the end, we need to come together to close that gap. And we need to continue to give hope to those many that today would be hopeless. It's possible, and as Nelson Mandela said, it becomes um, possible after you've addressed how impossible it is, uh, you, you make it happen. And I think we can make that happen. So thank you so much for giving me the honor to speak with you today.
Thank you so much for your lecture. It is an honor for me, a great privilege to be here and to interview you. I will start to ask you, uh, while you point many areas where, um, in which we are making progress, uh, you also highlight a world of um, poverty, growing inequality, of hate becoming more and more mainstream. Um, as a mother, um, as parents, uh, how, do we can, how do we give hope to our children when uh, the negative messages about the others and, me and message of hate um, are becoming mainstream through, mainly through social media and other channels and even in politics? I think it's even more when you see this pushback against what should be the norm that you need to revisit that um, in your families. I, I think that the role of of parenthood must be one that we take responsibility. In my family, for instance, we ban the use of the word right from the very beginning of hate. We don't use hate in our family at all. You, we, it's so, uh, I hear so many family children saying, I hate this and I hate that and I hate the other, and I say, no, no, we're not going to use the word hate. You can dislike intensely, but no hate. And I, I think that this is you know, something that you do from the upbringing. I think also don't, um, I've, I've looked over the years, um, as we were brought up, what were the things that I had that made me the person I am today that I need to pass on to my children? Um, and, I, and I think that healthy respect uh, for the people in your community starts from the family. Um, families that we come from are um, large, and, and uh, you know, I always say that in Nigeria, um, Nigerians, if they stretch their hand, they can touch poverty in their home. Um, now we lived a privileged life because I was, you know, the, far, the, 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 the daughter of a, a civil servant. Um, but in our communities, we had very poor family and very, and, and you needed to respect that and you needed to teach your children. So it really does start from the seed that you grow and how you nurture that. Um, Islamically, uh, we, we follow the three sevens. The seven, first seven years of your child's life are about nurturing them and loving them. The second are about discipline. So really explaining what is acceptable, what is not, in terms of tolerance and respect. Um, and the third, they become your friend. Because any child after 14 that doesn't have a healthy respect to their parents and is a friend, you're going to have great difficulty trying to convince them otherwise later on. So I think from the family, from the society, this starts. And then I think that you, know, you very quickly become part of a society in a workplace. Um, the places that we take for granted are the ones that you need the most to deal with. Um, and I think that uh, here you, uh, you will come across such diversity of opinion, of upbringing, of, um, of, of things that you in your own space would not f feel you could tolerate. But that's all the more reason why you have to. Uh, and today, as I said, when you see people pushing back, largely it is ignorance, it is fear, and I think that you have to embrace that head on and deal with it and keep people um, informed and, and more knowledge, more um, understanding, um, as they say, you, you, you show love and uh, you, you, will, you will get some back. Um, I had a difficult childhood. I'm a person of color. Um, and it was very strange because I at one point went to school in a place where there were no people of color. And so this became a challenge for us, discrimination. Um, and my mother, who is white, uh, would say to me, well, okay, so if this is the names they're calling you, maybe you can call them these names. But in my head, I was of two. And so that sense of um, identity that I belong to the world and I could take the best out of either side um, was one that I would, in the end, um, stop and, and explain to people um, and, and try to ask the question, why so much um, discrimination? Why so much hate? It was, in the end, nine times out of 10, it was a lack of knowledge. It was ignorance. It was fear. Um, you were different. <coughs> um, and I think that these basic human, um, uh, human feelings you need to deal with. Um, and I, sometimes we, we pay too much uh, too much uh, notice to the technical. We become very theoretical, um, and uh, we forget the human side of it. OK. You talked about the gap between words and action, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes due to a lack of political will. Um, political will is often shaped by popular sentiment, and we've been seeing that movement around the world, mainly on Western countries, but no, not only. How do we mobilize people uh, for, uh, to support greater inclusion when at the same time we have these political trends uh, uh, moved by popular uh, sentiments? I think most of us today um, who have thought we, we had passed certain, certain uh, levels <coughs> of uh, accepting human rights and, and, 
and respect and tolerance for one another are horrified at what we have seen in changes of leadership. Um, but I think we have to ask the question why. Um, people are not born with hate. Um, they're not born in positions where um, they would become terrorists. There, there are root causes to this. And I think that perhaps over the years, there has been a number who have felt excluded. And so the lack of trust in institutions and, and in leadership that thought they had everyone in the tent and didn't. And so I think it's very important for us to engage, um, to continue doing what is the right thing and, 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 uh, and advocating for it. Um, but always leave the conversation open. Never close the door. Um, never think that uh, this has gone so wrong that we cannot engage <coughs> with what we're hearing. I think if we don't, we will be worse off for it. And could you imagine a worse? Um, we have many countries where uh, we negotiated the, um, for instance, the Global Com Compact on Migration. In that negotiation, if you really heard some of the um, positions that were put forward, we would have thought that this world was going to collapse and that we would never get a global <coughs> compact on migration. But in the UN, the larger number of countries, not the, not the few that didn't sign on, the larger number believed in the good of migration um, and in, in the need for us to address it um, and to put something on the table that we could all see uh, as a global endeavor. Um, it took a while. And I have to say that as we got closer to signing on to um, the, 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 the Global Compact on Migration, we were not sure if it was going to happen because of a few. But I think in the end, the majority pulled um, and came through with it. And today, we're looking at over 130 countries uh, where we're mapping how we roll out that Global Compact on Migration. So it is, as Antonio Guterres often tells us, you know, many headwinds, navigate them, just don't give up. Do not give up on what seems to be um, a regression in what we see uh, for human rights, uh, for tolerance, um, for basic, you know, forwarding of, of, of our agendas uh, for, for prosperity and peace. Sure. But when you look um, um, at a region like Europe, mm -hmm. and the European Union at, is at the same time um, an economical club, uh, an elite. At the same time, we have a demographic issue, a problem. But at the same time, um, we, have a, we don't know how to deal with the refugees in, in, in some of our biggest countries and most developed countries, developed countries? I think we're beginning to understand um, how to do that. I think that we have not been honest enough to have the conversations that are uncomfortable. There's a lot of very nice um, diplomacy around many issues. People are afraid yeah. to upset the status quo that is going in the wrong direction. I think that you have to stop that and have those honest conversations. They've begun to happen, the recent elections in the European Union were ones that no one thought we would get. We thought maybe a third um, of the results would go um, to the more popular side. We didn't see that. So I think that um, what I would say is that you know, voices of those who believe should come out of shock and amplify what is right and to try to get back that space that we lost and to understand why we lost it and how we need to keep it. Now, this is where I think that we, we do begin to talk about a, a universal agenda, um, the Agenda 2030, those 17 goals are applicable to North, South, East, and West. This is not a develop, developing country narrative. It's not the story anymore. We are um, we're witnessing globalization that has been exclusive to few, and we need to make that just, um, and we have the ways and means to do it, and, and part of that is to, to address our economies, to address leadership um, with the right arguments uh, for being more inclusive. You cite uh, both Canada and Portugal as is in Plary, um, in trying to create more inclusive and equal society, societies. But at the same time, Canada is a big country, Portugal is a very small uh, country. Can we put those two, two such a different countries on the same uh, level? It, you know, when you come to the United Nations, everyone has a voice. It's how you use that voice, whether you are big or you are small. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see um, Portugal I mean, first of all, we have seen a leader that's taken the helm of affairs as a secretary general. Um, and he could have just been a scripted secretary general. But he comes with an enormous amount of um, experience and a history, um, not only as a leader of a country, but as um, one who in the United Nations led an agency um, that looked at the humanitarian crisis. Um, coming in, what he brings with him, and this, I, I say this only as Antonio Guterres because he's one example I can use here and now, but there are many, many Portuguese, many leaders um, that do this in their individual and collective way. Um, and, and what he brings is a vision for first, he has the opportunity to say, let's prevent the crisis around the world. We don't have to keep tolerating this and we need to do something 
about stemming that, and he believes the 2030 agenda is one. At the same time, he said, do we need to continue um, with the conflict? Do we need to continue with the crises we see around the world? How can we now move that to a vision of transition? That we actually have an exit strategy for crisis. That we're not sitting in it for a decade after decade, um, keeping the peace without really looking at what the root causes are for that. So I think that from a small country comes great vision um, and the courage to put that on the table and use your experiences, as we say, for making that happen. Um, for, for Canada, this is a federal system that mirrors many uh, other systems that are not working as well. So they have a lot to share, acknowledging their past um, and that things did not always work, but that did not stop you for trying to right the wrongs um, and, to, and to do that. And I think sharing this is, has been uh, one of the credits that we would certainly give to Canada. I've, I've seen that through the development work that we've done in federal systems um, that have had the challenge of how you include um, everyone from the local governments through states to, to a federal order um, of, of trying to, to, to policy make and govern. When I look at, when we look at the country, at the world with where so different countries, so different stages, is it possible to have the same goals when you speak about these, these kind of main questions? Uh, is it possible? Absolutely. I mean, you, you, need, to, you need to read the goals. Yeah. Um, they're an odd number. And that's because the reality is not square. It's not got neat corners or completely round and perfect. The world is imperfect, and so those goals came in an imperfect number. We thought we could have 10. Let's move from 8 to 10. It's neatly packaged. We can communicate it. But it was not the reality of the world's reflection of what yeah. they needed to do. And what they put in this agenda at the center is economies. And to say the economies needed to be inclusive, that we needed to have equality. People needed to be part of what it was that was growing. So if a country like mine is growing and 80% of the population are living below the poverty line, something is wrong. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to fix it. So if you look at the goals, I don't think there is a goal that doesn't apply to Portugal. But is it, is it fair to have the same goals on, on Germany and Nigeria at this time? It's the same goals, they're just prioritized differently. Mm -hmm. You may not have to do much on ending poverty in Germany but you certainly have a lot to do on inequalities, on the transition for energy, um, on some of the economic inclusion, so on circular economy. You prioritize them differently, but those, those 17, I believe, apply to every country today. There is a universal challenge that we need to address, and there isn't any one country that those 17 goals don't apply to. Okay, good answer. Um, <laughs> uh, Took four years for us to get yeah, there. Okay. <laughs> But let me say, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just the governments. Huh? I mean, really, foundations, civil society, young people. I mean, they told us about the world we want, and it was not what we thought. Um, and, you know, we, after two years, I was reading The World We Wanted by Young People. And then I, I read from the Nordic countries, and they wanted water and education. And I thought, OK, hold on a minute. There's something really wrong here. As far as I know, Sweden and Norway don't have a problem with access to portable water or education. But what they were doing, they still hadn't got round to the universal agenda. So they were, doing, they were giving us a world they wanted for others and not looking in the mirror. And once we turned that question around, we then found different answers coming from countries like that that talked about equality, that talked about gender parity, uh, which you know, we all know now the figures are showing us that there's a universal issue. Um, and so this is, uh, this is very much an agenda that was designed I think by the world, everyone had uh, participated, business participated. At the beginning in 2012, we spoke different languages, completely different languages. They would come into the UN, we would talk that way, they would talk the other way. Uh, eventually, um, we've come you know, with an understanding that there are principles and it's not corporate social responsibility that needs to increase, it's the business model that needs to change to make it more sustainable, that people and the environment are at the center and that you can still make profits, but not off the back of people and planet. Last question. As a journalist, I must ask, ask you, uh, what role do you see for the media uh, in galvanizing support for the goals and for the action to reduce inequalities at the same time where the media sometimes tend to be, act like a mirror of a political landscape that is changing a lot and becoming more polarized? I think maybe two things. I think the media needs to tell a good story. We don't yeah. often tell good stories. And so therefore, the projection of what's happening in the world 
is much more negative than it is the positives. But you know see. that uh, you lived in, in, in the UK, that sometimes the bad story, it it's, runs pretty it's, well. and it's, it's an excuse. Yeah. It's an excuse. You are smart people and you know how to get a headline. It doesn't always have to be a bad one. Mm -hmm. There are good headlines and you can do that. Now, why should you do that? Well, after you go home, nine to five, and you go home, you're one of the 7.5 billion people on this earth. Yeah. And so what happens to this earth matters. What happens to our communities matters. So you need to take that responsibility of future generations into your workplace and to say it's not just about um, I'm a media person today, but I'm also a person, a human being, and I have an individual and collective responsibility to make sure um, that we give back and that we do look at our humanity and that we are about um, each and every one of us, but coexisting um, and, and not to think you can sacrifice. You know, the media has a lot to do whether we see things positively or not. And now it's even more difficult for you because you say media, but social media is a whole new ball game, yeah. um, uh, which you know, many of us don't understand, um, but it's here to stay. It's not going away. Um, it is the world of young people. Um, it has enormous contributions to make to connecting our world, to connecting people, but it also has a dark side. And, uh, and unless we grapple with the balance in that, um, then we, we won't end up well, and media will not be a part of our um, development, our sustainable development. Um, in the end, it'll, you know, I hope that we don't leave you behind. Because I think that this is, you know, the way technology is going now, just as education is going, it's not all about the teacher in the classroom. It's about what you can access. And, and, you know, media needs to shape that. You need to shape your constituency and its contribution to our humanity. Okay. Now you can have uh, two, three questions from the, the audience. Um, if someone wants to, to make some question to uh, Ms. Amina Mohammed. Especially young people. Yeah, special <laughs> young people, yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tomás Esvedo, and I'm a Deputy Diplomatic Advisor at the Prime Minister's Office. And um, thank you, Madam, for your uh, lecture this evening. Uh, having, being an African and a Muslim, I would ask you, um, how do you see the evolution of LGBT rights in both the Islamic world and in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Easy question, right? Yeah. Um, really difficult. <laughs> really difficult. Um, I think when we talk about rights, we of course have to say all rights and they're indivisible. But one of the things that we don't underscore is progressive. We've said rights are indivisible, but we've said progressive. And I think that in Africa and Islam, um, this has to come along with a really healthy conversation about survival. Um, and about respect for diversity, respect for everyone to choose their path, and that the only judge, at least in Islam as I know it, the only judge is God. Um, and it's not people, and I think what we've done is taken over roles that we have no business doing. Um, everyone is entitled to their path. Um, and, and to be judgmental of that and not accepting and discriminatory is something that we, we should never accept. So I think from our own community, um, we need to begin uh, to see that. I, I think where the challenge is, is that in, at the same time is for everyone to see how those rights play out in, in our countries uh, individually um, and collectively. What is, uh, how can we have that conversation that is not either or? Um, I, I don't think that that's you know, something that we, we, can, we can accept. So I hope that we will, um, I mean, I, I think the way sometimes we have the conversation of rights in our countries is about either or, and, and so you find uh, places where they have great challenges in, in just living that daily life, not knowing if they're going to uh, survive tomorrow, um, it's not a conversation that they will have. Um, and I think that this is, is wrong, but we have to find entry points for that. And, and I think that, you know, everyone, LGBT um, uh, rights are as important as any other. Um, these, these are people. This is us. Um, and it's our family, and so we, we need to make sure they're inclusive. But it's, it's not easy. Um, we, across the world, different countries are at different levels. Um, I think we have to find entry points in our recent reform in the UN. Um, we've looked to say that, look, human rights is a core, um, at the core of the universal agenda that we have today, the SDGs. How do we actually operationalize that? Um, and I think here it's really important for us um, to, to have that conversation with the government, but also to have those that will help us 
uh, to make sure that all rights are respected, um, irrespective of, of your beliefs. Okay. Next question. Um, my name is Ines Relvas. I'm a project leader here in Boston Consulting Group from Lisbon. Working in a mainly uh, male-dominated industry uh, and in the big corporate uh, companies here in Portugal, I would love to hear how the UN has reached uh, gender parity in the leadership roles and how can we do this better in the new uh, companies? What kind of uh, activities and what kind of initiatives actually worked uh, from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, leadership is key. I mean, without the leader we have, I wish I could take all the credit for Antonio Guterres, but he's a feminist. He's our number one feminist. And, um, so I think that men and women in leadership, you have to open up that space for it to happen. You have to put in a strategy that you follow. Um, putting gender parity in the United Nations two years ago didn't happen even when it started. We got such pushback. I mean, everybody mouthed that they thought gender parity was a great thing. But the practice of it um, was huge. Uh, it was a huge pushback. Um, so we followed that from where the Secretary General had um, sway, so where he could take decisions over the appointments he made. Uh, he did that. I mean, either side of him is a woman. Um, on our floor, we have parity. Uh, within the resident coordinators that he appoints, 130 of them, we have parity. Um, it takes more in our agencies, funds, and programs because they're governed differently, so you require a conversation with member states who govern, um, but you also require leadership from each and every one of those that, that, um, that lead the, the institutions. You need a conversation with men. Um, I think, you know, to assume that everybody thinks that the right thing is what we do um, is different because um, for every, for us, um, when we were trying to get parity, when men came for their renewals, it was unlikely they were gonna get renewed where there was a better woman. Uh, so we opened up that space. I think what was more difficult for us um, has been in areas where there aren't the women, because in fact, the training of women in the peace and security side is few and far between. To, to, so to go to academia, to go to where we would get more people, more women in science and encourage that in different countries, um, that, that's extra work, which is why our parity strategy um, will take to 2021. Um, but it, it's a concerted effort to make it happen. And it also requires you as a person um, in my conference room, I have a big, um, it's probably as big as the carpet over there, a big board that is um, just pictures of, it's a collage of women, women from all over the world, um, and uh, leaders and, and, and otherwise. Um, and behind me are the SDGs. So I always sit on the side where the SDGs are behind me, and then the women are behind the delegation that comes to meet me. And if the delegation is all men, I would say to them, well, today you're in good company because you're surrounded by women and next time maybe we could have a little bit of a balance. It's the conversation you have with people that they don't even realize that everything around them was men. Um, I, I walked in here to the people who are doing a wonderful job uh, live streaming us, but they were all men. And, and I, you know, so I'm conscious of it and I'll say it with the best intention um, uh, that, that you can have women behind the camera. Uh, my daughter's a filmmaker, so I know it's possible. <laughs> And I have to say that even there, when we talk about women, I said to my daughter, and this is, this is terrible, I don't know if she's watching right now, but she wanted to be a film actress. Um, and she said, this is what I want to do. And I thought, there's nothing wrong with them, but. Um, so I, I convinced her that her life would be much longer behind the camera than in front of it. She'd have a longer <laughs> career. But I, I think, you know, genuinely, women deserve to have that opportunity uh, to take up positions that they are qualified for. Um, and, and should not be discriminated against, and, and many are left out. We still have, even when you get into a position of leadership, how do you sustain that? So is it just a woman that comes for a term, a president that comes in for five years, 10 years, and then is replaced by a man? How do we sustain women in leadership? Um, and that needs a pipeline. It needs to make sure we're educated, we have the exposure, the experiences, um, that we can actually step into those positions when asked. It's not automatic, we have to earn it but we also have to be given the opportunity to learn and to experience and to be exposed. Okay, any other question from the others? Yes, there, last question. Uh, my name is Katia Carvalho. I am a researcher from the University of Porto and um, I am from the academia. And often uh, we scientists find ourselves locked in an environment only composed by other scientists. And um, we would like to do more and what I would like to know uh, is what is your advice 
for researchers, particularly for young, young researchers uh, who want to help uh, governments and uh, the United Nations to achieve the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you really much. important to have research. I mean, thank you scientists for what you're doing on, on climate change to bring that reality to us so that we have the evidence that we can show for policy changes that need to be made. We could never address the G20 that have 82% of the emissions if we didn't have the science behind it. So we still need to keep at it. More people need to be involved. I think there are probably two things. One, we need to see much more action research. We need to get evidence in front of policymakers that they can use and without having it go through 10 to 20 years of, of, of fine tuning. You need to have it here and now to make the case um, because it's such short term, that cycle of leadership and everyone wants to make a difference in that term. They don't very often see it as part of their legacy in a generation or two. So I think we need help there to make the case for why uh, leadership should make the investments they need to make in the short term in order to get the long term gains. That needs to happen. The second thing is that in, in this universal response that we require, um, we need to see much more resources being traded across academic institutions, north and south. There's huge amounts of practice um, and um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the reality of what is on the ground uh, that does not have the resources um, to, to bring that out into the, the, the place where you can shape policy. In developing countries, there's very little resources. In developed countries, a huge amount of resources. The endowments that go into universities and, and places of learning are huge. How can you have a better um, collaboration? I think that's really important. We've started to see it on the SDGs. We have a number of networks, but more. And it shouldn't be a problem with young people. I think that young people have got a lot of, of value to bring here, particularly in, in connecting. But I would say that the real place for this is, is action research. More work with civil society, because they're on the ground, they're closest to it, and, and, and that, that would really help us to, to look at, uh, to look at the, the case for scale um, uh, from, from, uh, from, from that. Thank you very much okay. for your answers. I now ask, um, I now invite uh, Ms. Adrian Clarkson to join us in the podium for the uh, closing uh, remarks. Um, thank you very much. Um, Adrian Clarkson is a former Governor General of Canada, uh, is one of the directors of Global Center for Pluralism, is co-founder of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship and a renowned journalist. Thank you very much. As I see you clap and hear you clap, I think you are acknowledging how privileged we all are to have been at this talk by Amina Mohammed. The Guardian, when she was appointed by Guterres uh, as Deputy Secretary General, had the edifying headline, Goat Herder's Daughter Number Two at the UN. That is something that I am sure she's quite used to, as all women in public life are used to headlines like that. But she is an example of something so shining and so bright and so beautiful. The encapsulation of two worlds, of two races, a woman who is a Muslim, who is strong, who has been able to move from the world of private sector business into the world of science, into the world of world government, is somebody that we have to listen to. Because you won't hear voices like that very often. Because you don't hear voices from somebody in that kind of position of power who talks about their children and their grandchildren and the aspirations of their child because women do think differently. Women behave differently when they are in positions of power. And they behave... <laughs> they behave that way and they think that way because it is a very positive thing 
to be the bearers of life. And that's what women understand themselves to be. And women understand themselves, no matter how high a position they reach, they realize that they are the ones who ensure the continuance of human life on its most basic level. Everybody has a mother. Everybody has a mother, and the mother's instinct, the mother's idea of being able to give life and everything that comes with that, the idea of nurturing, the idea of seeing something through from very unpromising beginnings, which babies are, difficult, not, I think many of us are not made out to be mothering or maternal, and it is a shock to feel the revulsion in your body when you hear a baby crying at three o'clock in the morning and you have to be the one getting up to go to it. But you go through that, and when you bring that to your public life and to your public commitments and to all the things that are offered to you, you become somebody like Amina Mohammed. She is an example to all of us. She is an example of what you can achieve. She is an example of how you can take what has been given to you in terms of intelligence, in terms of the cards that are dealt to you, which you have to play. They're only a certain number, and they're not going to change, but it depends on how you play them. And I thank you so much for this privilege of listening to you in the context of this annual lecture for the Global Center for Pluralism. You have given us so much with your thoughtful humanity, your incisive intelligence, and what is very noticeable and which is always important in somebody who has reached the heights that you have that there is courage behind everything that you say. And courage is the most important of virtues because it guarantees all the others. Thank you so much. <laughs>